you know, I read that section two by Aiken, and I was not completely convinced about this. Uh, I was waiting to have a, um, a class on, you know, speaking about the whole discussion of Christology from below and Christology from above. I think uh, that division is naive, you know, uh, pretending that you can approach Jesus, for example, without any preconceptions about who he is, or about God, or about God's revelation. There's, I mean, someone who has not heard anything about this person, who is, whose name is Jesus of Nazareth, who lived 2,000 years ago, can come to me and say, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I have this interest of doing research about this person. And then, you know, go to the Bible and try to follow um, the, the biblical text, trying to come up with his own conclusion. In that case, probably, but not even in that case. Uh, most of the time, when you approach Jesus, you have already a, a set of preconceptions about what you want to find and what you don't want to find. Um, and in that sense, you want to give me something, huh? you, um, and in that sense, it is impossible to begin purely with a Christology from below. There's always something taking a place of that above. You don't want, you know, there's some scholars who don't want to have um, a certain above, they, don't, they want to reject, and I think they're right in that. You don't want to start a Christology just by uh, believing certain metaphysical conceptions first and trying to fit Jesus in those metaphysical conceptions. That would be the criticism of, of those who start the Christology from below. And in that particular case, they are fine. They're right. We don't want to start just by saying God is like this, and so since we already know how God is, we're going to fit into that conception how Jesus is. Because that's against the way the Bible presents Jesus. Uh, Jesus is not like the God you already know. You know. Jesus is supposed to give you the information, the critical and dispensable information about how God is. You see? And so Aiken will tell you that behind should be connected with the Old Testament. You know, is, is it Old Testament the one who give you the behind? But it's a little more complex than that, though. Because most evangelicals sometimes give the impression that in the case of Jesus, Jesus has come only to fulfill what was already clear in the Old Testament, you know, prophecies. And of course there are prophecies. Of course there are certain things that Jesus come to fulfill as a Messiah. But the fact remains that when Jesus appears, <clears throat> he uh, give you so much clarity about certain things in the past, and some others are completely changed in terms of who he is, that the writers of the, of the New Testament when, uh, when uh, appealing to the Old Testament, sometimes they, they, um, uh, what they produce is not simply, uh, you know, a, a, a proof, uh, a series of proof texts from the Old Testament. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to communicate here. They are sometimes finding things that for most readers were not there in the Old Testament, but they have found it because they have been in touch with Jesus. You see what I'm saying? And if by that they, they believe that this is, you know, in the case of Aiken, if they believe that this is a theology from behind, um, I wouldn't have any problem. I think it's, however, as far as I read it, and I know this is complicated, as far as I, as I read it, he is not as clear as I would like in this particular connection. So, theology from below, theology from 
from above, theology from behind, I would suggest to you to completely forget about those um, divisions. They are they don't do justice to the complexity of the whole thing. What is important to you is that the Jesus of the New Testament is the final authority by which you uh, judge, pass judgment on everything, including the Old Testament. And that for this guy will sound a little too much. You see? Because, uh, um, and, and again, that's not simply a theology from above. There's no way for me to say, well, I'm reading Jesus just by, um, uh, without any presupposition, and I'm reading Mark and Matthew that way. No, forget about it. This is hermeneutics 01. Hermeneutics 01, that sometimes it's not 01 because um, a lot of evangelicals don't go there until very late in their theological development. Hermeneutics 01 means that you cannot get rid of your presuppositions. You are supposed to be aware of them and confront, confront those presuppositions with the data that you're finding, you know, ever finding in the scripture. But there's no one of us who can get rid of our presupposition just because of why I want to get rid of them. You see what I'm saying? So the way I, I perceive reality as a, as a Latin American, for example, is different from the way you perceive it, guys. And that's fine. I, I, I can, you know, and you need to be aware of the fact that you know, some of you who are not Latin American, and there's a, there's a lot of Latin Americans here, of course. <laughs> but the thing is that um, by doing that, I'm not saying that the way I perceive Jesus is the correct one. But what I'm, see, what I'm saying is that perhaps the way I perceive Jesus may help other of my brothers in other geographies to perceive some things they, ha they haven't seen. And the other way around. The way that you see Jesus in your perspective, from your perspective, from your context, could help me as a Latin American see certain things that I'm not able to see either. See? And so that's the way to, to go ahead with presuppositions. Are we ready for this? Uh, for the video, yeah. For the video. Okay, we can, we can do something on that, unless you have more questions, guys. I wanna give you some, some time to, to talk with me. You know, there are several issues that you have been reading in your books, and hopefully we have some time to, to talk about them. You know, there's, there's many things. Wellum has several things there that are important. Um, and other things too. Uh, you know, it's good. We have videos here already for there's a lady who want to talk to us about women and Jesus, and that's that's good. But if you don't have questions or observations or criticisms, that's fine. That's good. No questions. No questions. You know, this, again, this is a very easy class. I like them because of that. <laughs> this is not. Let's do something with, with this then. And um, um, then we will have more time to talk about the gospel Christologies and Paul Christology. Hi, my name is Emily Davidson, and I will be presenting on Jesus and women. Um, I'm actually in the college at Southwestern, or Scarborough, I guess is what it's called now, but um, this is my last semester, but I um, had to move to Arkansas because my husband took a youth pastor position. So I'm finishing my last, my last two classes via um, master's classes online. Um, so I'm really excited about my topic. I um, 
prior to coming to Southwestern probably would not have been called a complementarian. I probably um, would have been called, probably would have called myself a Christian feminist or something to that effect. But um, I hadn't studied at all um, what it meant to follow the Lord and be a woman and be a Christian. And, um, so since coming to Southwestern, I've taken biblical womanhood classes and really studied these things more closely. Um, and so when I saw my topic, I was excited because um, I've really come to appreciate and value um, the value that Jesus put on women. Um, so yes, um, I'm first going to talk a little bit about the culture at the time of um, Jesus' time and, and go back a little bit and look at the Old Testament and the rules that were in place for women and why they were there. Um, and then look at a few cases where Jesus interacts with um, the untouchables or less than um, repu reputable women. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to look at um, mainly focus. I think most of my paper will be on Mary and Martha um, because those are the most consistent relationships he has. We consistently see him interact with them three different times. Um, so yeah, those will be kind of the general outline of my presentation and my paper um, once I finish that. Um, so first, looking at the culture of women in um, the first century, um, actually going back to the Old Testament, if we look at um, Leviticus, for one, um, people who don't study the Bible but hear things or might read a little bit will often say, wow, the Old Testament is so oppressive to women. There are all these rules about um, patriarchal, you know, being under men, being under their fathers, being under... Um, their husbands, and if their husband dies, they just get a new husband. They don't get a choice. Um, they don't get to keep their money. They don't, all these things. Um, when we study those more closely, we see that the Lord put these rules in place to protect women um, at that time, that he arranged so that if their husband died, the, they wouldn't remain a widow, but they would have a new source of income. Um, but it is true that women, if they made if they made something, if they did something to receive income, that immediately went to their whoever was, whichever male was above them, whether that be their father um, or when they marry their husband, or if they're a widow, their husband's brother who they marry, or their brother, whatever the the male highest above them. Um, so these things were carried on into um, Jesus' time, obviously, and actually a little bit more extreme. Um, as the Pharisees did, they um, would take the basic commandments of the Old Testament and apply so many more boundaries and rules, um, which originally, I would say, was from a good place. They wanted to create more boundaries in order to obey the law and obey God, um, but it created extreme space between um, men and women or between, um, as we see, as we've been studying, between Jesus and um, well, Jesus broke down all barriers, but um, between people, between Jews and Samaritans, um, etc., there was just a lot of barriers that, of course, Jesus broke down um, and did not, as he says, did not abolish the law, but fulfilled it. He brought new life to these things. So um, Jesus didn't come in like a crazy radical, um, you know, he didn't, we know, as far as we know, he didn't marry and he didn't. Um, he wasn't crazy with women, but he was respectful, and he addressed them in ways that um, was not socially acceptable at the time. So um, just to kind of list some things, women in Jesus' time um, primarily stayed at home. They were not educated. Um, what they knew of the Bible was very basic, and um, but the Bible being the Old Testament, obviously. Um, they were given um, instruction by their, again, their father or their husband. They would be under their father until you know, approximately the age of 13, 15, um, and then be engaged and married off. Um, and then they remained in the home and they had children and they took care of their home and that was their place. Um, if they were out and about, they did not interact with males in public. And um, this is actually something we still see in some Middle Eastern um, places. So my husband and I went to Egypt last spring break, and you'll see this there, um, at least in the older generations, you'll see that men and women um, really don't interact in public, and you certainly don't see um, married women interacting with different married men. Um, with the younger generations, you see a little bit more, but anyways. Um, so, also, um, Levitical law prohibited um, women who were unclean, whether that be from birth or from their cycle or from some kind of sickness, um, to 
interact with other people. So that was still the case when Jesus was um, on the earth. And so um, we just will look at some stories in which he really breaks down these boundaries and cares for women who were considered untouchable. Um, so first we see in John 7, 53 through 8, 11. I, I won't read these first few because I'm kind of just highlighting these. But um, we see Jesus with the adulterous woman. And we all know the story. Um, this woman is brought before Jesus by, um, I think, several Pharisees and men. I probably find reference or find the passage. but um, And they say, this woman's committed adultery. What do we do? And Jesus says, let he who is innocent, who is without sin, cast the first stone. And they, they it says from the oldest to the youngest, and walk away slowly. It says he writes something in the dirt, and we don't know what that is. Um, but I've I read some commentaries and some theologians on this, and many say that these Pharisees would, again, this is from a theologian's perspective. We don't know this to be true. This isn't in you know the exegetical passage, but. Um, Often, the, the men had no consequences for committing adultery. So it's very possible that these men that he was, um, you know, saying cast the first stone had had even used this woman, it's or you know had had slept around. And so um, in that culture, women committing adultery it was a, a death sentence. But for men, there was no um, retribution. So um, it's so we watched the men walk away, and then Jesus gently tells her she's been forgiven and to sin no more. And uh, so that's our first just kind of Jesus, one, speaking to an adulterous woman, and two, forgiving her of her sins and being kind and gentle to her rather than stoning her as was the law. Um, next, we see in John 4 um, that she just interacts with the Samaritan woman um, at the well. And again, we know the story. He comes up, he asks for a drink of water, and even she's shocked that he's speaking to her because one, she's a Samaritan, and two, she's a woman. And so by both those things, Jesus is breaking cultural boundaries because he's interacting. Um, Jews did not speak to Samaritans, um, and Jews, men, did not speak to women. And then we go on to find out that she's not only a woman, but she's been married, I think, five times and is living with a man that isn't even her husband. So this is not a woman of a good reputation, and Jesus knows that. Um, but he speaks to her with truth. He gives her the truth. He talks about living water. And um, this unreputable woman goes on to share who he is and share about Jesus to her entire town. Um, and so Jesus uses this woman of a bad reputation to reach these people and to share who he is. Um, and then third of my basic highlights, um, we have the bleeding woman who reaches out and touches Jesus um, whatever, shirt, um, in Mark 5, 25 through 43. Um, and so, again, we know the story. Jesus is walking to go heal the, um, the dying child. And um, this woman reaches out and he says, who touched me? And, of course, his disciples are like, there are people everywhere. Lots of people are touching me. Um, but he says he felt the power goes out, go out of him. And so he turns and she apologizes because she's unclean. So for her to touch him is essentially to make him unclean. Um, people you know, with leprosy or bleeding or whatever um, couldn't touch clean people. It made them unclean. Um, and so she apologizes, and he says, no, your faith has made you well. Um, also, I wanted to point out, in, in so many of these passages, those that I've mentioned and those that I haven't, Jesus frequently refers to women as daughter, which is very... Um, gentle and affectionate and um, not something that men typically did. Um, and so that's just a really cool little tidbit about the way that Jesus is so gentle and kind to women in ways that men did not at the time. Um, so those are kind of just my three quick highlights of women that Jesus probably should not, according to the law, interact with, but he did with such gentleness. And he, um, in all three cases, he um, frees them from their sin, he tells the adulterous woman, go, be freed, sin no more. He um, acknowledges the Samaritan woman's sin and brings her to know truth. And then he frees the bleeding woman, one, from her physical ailment, but then also um, is in kind and, and tells her that her faith has, has healed her. Um, so now I want to focus more seriously on Mary and Martha. Um, I've always loved Mary and Martha because I think... 
all people, but specifically all women can relate to one side or the other, um, at least in the initial story. So let's read that really briefly. In Luke 10, 38 through 42, um, we see, let me find it, sorry. Um, so we see that Jesus has gone to stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And Martha is doing what she's supposed to do as a woman. Um, let me just read this real quick. It says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Um, and that was Luke 10, 38 through 42 ESV. So we see in this passage, um, Martha's doing what she was supposed to do as a woman. She um, is being hospitable, and she is cooking, and she's clean, and she's taking care of the guests in her home. And then there's Mary, who does what is not culturally acceptable. Um, women do not go and listen to teaching from scholars, from um, the Pharisees, from whoever. Um, they stayed in their home, they did their work. There was not a lot of learning and educating the women. Um, and so rather than helping her sister, she's sitting at Jesus' feet. And Martha appeals to Jesus' humanity as a Jew and says, this is not what she should be doing. Please tell my sister to come help me. Um, and I've been there, and all women have been there, where it's a lot easier to... Um, especially if you're type A like me, follow the list and say, I need to do this and this and this and this, and this is how I will serve the Lord. Um, but Jesus, at least I, I don't want to read into the passage, but it sounds gentle because he says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. He doesn't reprimand her, but he's just curbing her, saying, these are, these are good things, but this is not what you are to be focused on right now. Mary has chosen the good portion, and this will not be taken away from her. So, Mary, by sitting at by his feet and, and choosing to spend time with him and learn from him, has chosen um, the correct thing. And so, um, I, if I were Martha, I'd be slightly offended because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but Jesus commends Mary for being eager to learn and to grow and to seek him. Um, so our next passage is um, John 11, 1-44. And this is Lazarus' death. And so we see, um, I won't read this whole passage because it's pretty long, but um, a message is sent to him saying, Lazarus, Lazarus is dying, um, come quick. And of course, we know Jesus um, extends his stay and waits until Lazarus has died and then comes. Um, and so we see that when he gets there, Martha runs up to him and says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Um, and then here, let me read this part real quick. Um, she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask for from God, God will give you. Um, and I was reading a couple sources. Um, of course, I'll cite all of these in my paper. But um, And they talk about how this statement of faith is in some ways more um, serious than even when Peter commends Jesus as Lord or says Jesus as Lord. Um, because this is a woman, and she's... Um, in this time of grief, saying, Jesus, I know that you you are still powerful and you are God. Um, and so Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And here, she again, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And so here, after the first situation where we see Martha has not chosen the right thing, in this passage, it's so cool because we see that Mary has so, not Mary, I'm sorry, Martha has so much faith that she, even in this time of grief, grief and pain, she is um, showing that she trusts the Lord and putting faith in him. Um, and then, very similar, Mary comes, and, um, well, Martha goes to Mary and says, the teacher's here and is calling for you, and so Mary goes, and she says the same thing, and she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, um, and they don't have quite the same conversation, um, but she weeps, and Jesus weeps with her, so we see that this family, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, are very important to Jesus, and Jesus knows what's coming, Jesus knows that 
he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But because he cares for these women, he weeps with them. Um, just as he teaches, he mourns with those who are mourning. Um, and so we get to see Jesus's compassion and empathy and humanity in this moment, which is really cool. Um, and so then we go on, and um, there's not much more with Mary and Martha, except that their brother is raised from the dead. And so everyone praises Jesus because he's raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, and then lastly, and this, this one's a little bit trickier. So there are three, I think, three accounts of a woman, or maybe just four, a woman washing Jesus' feet. Um, but only one of them um, gives the account in the name of it. It's Mary from Bethany, Mary Martha, who is washing his feet. Um, I think another one refers to a woman of ill repute, so um, most likely a prostitute. And then the other one just says, the other one or two just says a woman. And so um, this is kind of interesting. I think I think it was two or th the majority of them um, say that he was in the area of Bethany, um, but not all of them say that. So there's some confusion about um, within the Synoptic Gospels of whether um, whether Jesus this happened more than once, whether several women and women anointed him, or if perhaps this um, was all Mary or or what. How much more is it the video? We already have we already have more than fifteen minutes, do we? Mm -hmm. She had uh, a two portion. It's about 10 more minutes. Because if it is too long, probably we should have stopped it right there. Okay. That's, that's fine. I think we have an idea what he, what she is doing. And it's good, I think. Um, just leave it. Okay. Uh -huh. um, okay, guys, Jesus and women. What would be some of the basic passages you will use to teach in your, she mentioned several, but what would be some of those? In my church, as I, I've been in, in several churches, I've been known for using those passages that no one else is using, you know? Okay, I wouldn't use the Samaritan too much. It's not that it's not important, don't get me wrong. But there's so much about that that sometimes people just, oh, okay, yeah, he comes here and they tell me again the same thing. Even if there are certain things that are, should be presented as new, um, I think uh, there are other, many other passages that should be brought to the discussion about Jesus and women. For example, women supporting Jesus financially. How is that? You know, possible. How was that? Uh, how was that seen in the in the context? Was that okay in the context, or was something irregular? Jesus as a celibate. Jesus not marrying a woman. Is that connected with the perfection of his human nature, or is his, you know? being a man just think about and you know sometimes if you have a blog you know those are the kind of questions that are very important i think to be completed in a, a full christology jesus and mary magdalene has been subjected to a lot of you know judgment and things but that's something that we need to explore you know in the gospel of thomas that you may remember you may know Mary Magdalene is presented as the uh, opposing leader of the early church. She was opposing Peter as the leader because of her connection with Jesus. Something like that. You need to have a word. You need to explain that and be, be careful about that. You know, again, you just can't leave it to the liberals or the others, you know, as they are called, the savage 
exegesis that a lot of time abounds in our churches and in our world. This is savage exegesis. You know, people uh, telling us the story of Jesus. Um, and with some of them credential, for example, uh, Jose Saramago, Nobel Prize, Brazilian. You know, he has a book on Jesus of Nazareth and where he says several things that I, you know, can, ah, but he's a Nobel Prize. You know, he's good in his writing. But again, some of those areas, we just, we just cannot leave, you know, whatever. No, that's not, that's not true. Come up with solid answer to that. And what I was telling you last time with you, I mean, that last class, check what Moltmann has to say in terms of the relationship of Jesus with women, not only in terms of seeing Jesus as the one who teaches us, men and women, but also as, as those who um, influence Jesus makes him, according to Moltmann, if you don't like Moltmann's uh, way of putting it, that's fine. But what is true is that the biblical texts tell us that Jesus, for example, was surprised. Was he surprised to find faith in one of these ladies, the Cyril Phoenicia, how do you say? Cyril Phoenicia lady? What is... How do, you, how do you explain that Jesus was surprised? When is it that we got surprised? And you don't expect something? You know, saying that of Jesus will tell you a lot about what it, what it means for him to be a real human. But because it's very easy for us to jump from, no, but, but, but he cannot be surprised. He's God. Because God is not surprised by anything, does he? Huh? And how Jesus formed his idea of, according to Moltmann, again, check that passage, guys, just for out of curiosity. In the way of Jesus Christ, that's the book of Moltmann. And check that section where he has a couple of pages on how Jesus reacted or related to women and how they, according to him, help him develop his human understanding. Sounds a little, uh, for conservative uh, theologians, huh? Someone helping Jesus to develop his human? Think about that. Think about the role of Mary as mother of Jesus in terms of helping him. Huh? His interaction with people. You are who you are because of the interaction you have with others. If Jesus is not like us in that respect, he's lacking something, humanly speaking. That's part of the, our discussion last time, guys. How do we explain, again, the connection between Jesus, and between the divinity and the humanity of Jesus? For most evangelicals, we're happy to emphasize his divinity. And we run quickly when, when this type of things come to say, no, he is God. You know, we're happy to emphasize Jesus' full divinity while neglecting his full humanity, even if formally emphasized or affirmed. We, we, wouldn't decide, we wouldn't deny completely or, you know, frankly, that Jesus is not a complete human being. But what is a complete human being? Hmm? What is a complete human being? This, is, this belongs to the same discussion of, of um, um, a Christology from below. You know that Pannenberg is the most famous uh, theologian who have uh, developed at the beginning in his book on Christology, early 60s. You know, full, uh, in Espanol, it was Fundamentos de Cristología, or I don't, I don't know how to say it in German, but it was like foundations of Christology. In English, it, is, it has a different title, Jesus, Man and God, or something like that. In that book, he emphasized the, the, the fact that we are supposed to start with the man Jesus and study the man Jesus, and after that, 
you know, only after his death and resurrection, then see how that is connected with his divinity. That is Christology from below, according to him, in that book. In his systematic theology, written later on, you know, probably a couple of decades after that book, in the, in the 90s, um, he kind of goes back, he backs up and says, you know, when I wrote this book, I wasn't completely, he doesn't say it in those words, of course, he has a better English than I. Um, in those days, I wasn't completely clear about the, you know, uh, the understanding of what a human is. When you say that Jesus, you need to understand how, what is um, Jesus' complete humanity. He says, um, I think it still is correct, but where do I find a right definition of who a human being is? If you, if you, uh, you know, if I'm trying to make myself understood here, um, whatever the answer for that, it means that you already have an anthropology, an anthropology that you're taking for granted. A philosophical anthropology. A human being is this and 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 this. And so Jesus has to fit in the, that in that description of who a real human is. And that's not possible already. This is this is this is not correct again because that type of Christology, even calling itself a Christology from below. Is a type of Christology from above because he's taken for granted already a set of theological or philosophical convictions to fit Jesus into those. You see what I'm saying? You follow me there, guys? Probably not, but you know, just to console me, just to give me some comfort here to tell me this, you know. So again, um, this idea of what Jesus is as a human being completely should be revised and should be subjected to what the text says. If the text says that Jesus was surprised, then you faithfully to the scripture, uh, unless the text tells you something else, you need to check how that is applied to Jesus as a real human being. You know, when he says, who touched me? Who touched me? Is he telling um, the people that he's just pretending not to know? That he was touched by this woman, or he actually was asking. If the text doesn't tell you that he already knew, let's say the text could have told you, but he already knew that he was doing this just because of the disciples or something like that. Like we are told in John, you know, when he prays to the Father, he says, Father, I know that you grant, have granted me everything already, but I'm doing this because of my disciples. Wow, that's, that gives me a, a lot of insight here. But in the other passages where that doesn't happen, you don't have the right to say Jesus was just pretending. Yes, sir. Um, I, I think I grasp your caution, maybe, mm -hmm. with trying to not separate or draw some clear-cut distinction between humanity and divinity. Uh, the difficulty lies, though, and, and I think, for me at least, I struggle with passages like Luke 2.52. Uh -huh. That's all used. I mean, how do you explain Jesus' increase in wisdom and step in favor with God's man? Is, is it the case that God starts as nothing and he's growing too? Or is it, in this passage, referring to this human characteristic of, uh, Mary has to feed Jesus so he grows to be a two-year-old who then grows to right, be a, right. you know, and that, to me, that would not imply that there's some sort of distinction because we, we believe that God existed before the foundation of the world. Right, right. And so there is still some difficulty there. Difficulty, tension with, right. with identifying something that appears to be speaking in some sort of human anthropological type of right language, right not something of the divine right. even though in the person jesus there's both right you know and so that's where I, the struggle i guess is welcome to the family <laughs> yeah well, i know I, it's I, uh, I'm to decipher, and that's what makes it difficult but there are times i think where it, it, it 
I guess it's difficult because we, we end up being the judge usually, and that's where the difficulty comes in. Rather than allowing solving, solving the, minute, the mystery sometimes is, is the problem, though. You, you need to realize that there are serious issues here that have not been and probably will not be solved by our, the way we think. There's, the, you know, so many times I, I have mentioned this already that maybe you're fed up with what I'm just saying. That there is a, how God deals with time and eternity in space that's something that only him can can uh answer and um know for sure we have to leave i that's my conviction with the tension without denying any of the extremes and and of course for some people that's not enough that's not um acceptable you need to find like a synthesis of that and they and this is what I'm complaining, that we, in order for us to solve the synthesis, we have been happy to solve it by means of emphasizing Jesus' divinity while we neglect his humanity. Where, where there are passages that tell you that Jesus went through a very natural process of development as a human being. And that you shouldn't avoid saying that. You should emphasize it, even if you don't know how to connect it with the divinity. The way the traditional church and the council have done it depends on a precise metaphysical model. Whenever you don't accept that model, and this is again the key here, because you, sometimes we conservatives don't want to have anything to do with philosophy, and then you realize that here is a big uh, um, intrusion, if you want to call it that way, of philosophy into our faith. You know, in order to understand Jesus' divinity and humanity and how they are connected in one person, you need to use this metaphysics that divides reality into nature and person. And there's those two things. And then, you know, we, I have some PowerPoint that I, w I wish I could show you to right now. So we have here these two spheres, you know, the human sphere, and that's human nature. And here is the divine, the deity. And so this metaphysics, a way of explaining reality, will tell you that these two realities here, by the way, two, you know, not one, two, but, but uh, at the end of the day, according to this way of seeing, the way we understand human nature it's, uh, you know, it's also connected with person. So an individual is composed of human nature and person. And so we deduce this philosophical term tells you that with the deity, it has to be the same. Deity is about nature and it's about person. And so when you go and revise what the councils try to present to us, it's a conflict between those who understand the union of these two things in the person of Jesus and in Jesus. And most of them, uh, you know, they try to, you, to, to, to join together human nature and divine nature. And uh, all those models have problems because if you fuse those two things, then God changes. If you fuse those two things, you change the human nature, and because of that, this is not a real human, uh, you know, after the union. It would be like a giant. It would be like a hybrid. You know what I'm saying? So the council, Chalcedon, for example, uh, will solve the whole thing by saying that the union in Jesus didn't take place at the level of nature, but at the level of person. So... Uh, and the, here's what I want you to understand, because even if this is very helpful, still doesn't solve all the problems. Because what they will tell you, Chalcedon Cal will tell you, is that this human nature of Jesus is impersonal, they will tell you. Does not have a person. The place of that person here will be supplied by the divine person. You see, so 
the divine, the logos will take place, will, the, will take the place of the human person, the one who is responsible for the human nature, the one who is one of the persons of the divine nature. You see, and this is, at the end of the day, the connection again here is something like this. Nature, nature, okay, human nature, divine nature, and here, person. Person. So, there's only one person with two natures, okay? So, that's the answer, in general, by Chalcedon of the hypostatical union because it's called hypostatical union because it doesn't re it doesn't reside in the physical or physics nature uh, of human or the deity but in the person but once again the two things that i want you to see here this is a previous metaphysics philosophical metaphysics that is used to maintain the mystery that we find in the New Testament. This is very helpful. It, it, does, it helps us not to deny the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. Uh, it helps us to maintain the uh, sovereignty of the deity, the omnipotence of the, of the deity, the omnipresence of the deity. The deity doesn't change his attributes because it's not the nature that is connected with the human nature. It is the person that is connected, you see. And because of that, it's not proper, according to this definition, that you should say, well, Jesus, uh, you know, sometimes he is man, sometimes he is God. No, that's not correct, because it's always the same person. It is the person who dies, for example. It is the one who experienced death. It's the person who, who experienced it. But again, one point that I want to emphasize here. If you don't have this type of metaphysics, what do you have? Do you have to take this metaphysics as also part of God's revelation? Or there is other type of metaphysics that could help us better. So far, at least for me, there's, there hasn't been any other type of metaphysics as useful as this one. But still, the fact remains that this is not revelation. This is philosophical um, metaphysics, helping theology. And the other thing that I want to emphasize here is that this metaphysics, even being helpful, even being... Um, useful as it is, still does not solve the main and central problem. If this human nature is impersonal, if it is the Lord, the Logos, who takes the place of the human person here, is this really a, a man, a normal man? Just to put it in, in you know, in a... An incorrect way of saying, is this a human man? Because it's, it's just human nature with a person that is not human. But so far, um, there is something uh, just right along with what you said. Um, and it's from uh, Hannenberg. Let's see if I can, I'm able to share. <clears throat> Tell me, guys, Wellum deals with this? I don't think so. Uh, Erickson deals with this? I don't think so. Wait for my Christology in, <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> because it has to deal with this. Basically, what he says is this. He says um, he urges to do Christology from below as a distinct, uh, distinct from doing it from above. And the reason is uh, that doing it from above presupposes the divinity of Christ and ignores the most important task of Christology. For him, namely, to present reasons for confessing the divinity of Christ. And then he makes the point you just made, to take the divinity of Christ as one starting point is to devalue the historical Jesus 
and his relationship to Palestinian Judaism. Right. But again, this is my point. He is right in that you cannot start only with you already knowing who God is and then try to fit Jesus into that conception that you already have of God. The way of doing it correctly is to understand that Jesus is the, is the revelation, the personal revelation of God closest to us, uh, climatic, or how do you say, the, the, the climax of the revelation, and check on him how is God the other way around. But the other thing that I, I had to mention about that is that at the end of the day, those who criticize this type of approach and say, well, you cannot start with God and then come to Jesus only second, um, they, at the end of the day, commit the same mistake. And this is what I was telling you about Panenberg. Because at the beginning, he tells you, you know, we need to start with with the with the with Jesus the man okay and we need to study this man and and develop an anthropology from this man and then later on he will tell you well i i you know i had to confess that in order to study man and to know who this man is i have to have previous conception about what is man and when you when you emphasize that you are telling me that you may not have the same preconceptions that a theology from above, a traditional theology from above has, but you have other type of preconceptions that you cannot avoid. And in that sense, methodologically speaking, is the same, is the same, even if you call it theology from above or theology from below, because you have taken something for granted and making that the definite factor for understanding who Jesus is. You see, and I think, you know, those who criticize, there are some valid points. Again, you, you know, when you go here and find the New Testament here, of course, and you go here to Chalcedon, they will complain, Chalcedonian definition, that you shouldn't start your Christology from the definition of Chalcedon, you know. And to be honest, a lot of Christologies, classical or otherwise, have started here. Okay, we need to develop, we need to proclaim, we need to uh, defend, do apologetics based on this. And that's a solid criticism that we need to. This is not, according to Maltman, Pannenberg, uh, Rahner, is not a place where you start your Christology. This is supposed to be seen as a place where you arrive after so many years and, and centuries. And because of that, even if it's useful, once again, it cannot be whole as something that is unsurpassable. The only unsurpassable thing that we have is the New Testament. We need to keep it. We need to keep that tension. If that tension remains, so be it. See, because there is no other way. Um, and you can still believe that this is useful, but still be aware again of the limitations. By the way, that's the reason why some Coptic churches in the north of Africa, North Africa, have not accepted the Chalcedonian definition. Because they believe this as a way of disguising Apollinarius. Apollinarius was the one who, who believed that there was, um, you know, in the incarnation, the mental, rational dimension of Jesus was actually the Logos. The rest was humanity. And if you, you, you see this, there's some validity that criticism because again maybe it's not about only mental areas in the person on the human nature here jesus but uh, of course also emotions uh, self-awareness that type of things but still the fact remains according to this 
this human nature, someone may very easily say, that's not a real man. Because a real man is not just, um, it's not someone who has, you know, physical appearance as a man, organs and everything in you, but that in that immaterial part of who you are is a man. And it's a man he develops with a history. He interacts with others. He is surprised. He is, he learns. He develops certain convictions. He learns. See, by the way, that's, uh, that's one of the things that are, is very critical. Did Jesus knew from the very beginning that he was the son of God as he was, you know, confessed later on? Or was there any progress in him as a human being, you know? Again, did he learn? Can we uh, place into that passage this process of awakening, just to use a word, to the reality that he was God incarnate? or not because the other option would be to have him as a baby you know just with the eyes again remember what I have told you sometimes the little the little how you call it el niño el tambor the little the little drummer boy you remember that cartoon thing you have seen it and and, and you go and watch it and you see the little boy there full of light you can see his eyes, and his eyes are shining, glory, you know, and the little boy sees it and something miraculous takes place. Sometimes, and this is, this is the idea of the Gnostic Gospels too. Again, the Gnostic, Gnostic Gospel who don't believe that Jesus was a real human being who went through a process. For them, Jesus was God completely full in full awareness of that, even being a baby boy like that, you know, and, and in that case, what kind of what kind of man is this? This is not a real man. This is a this is something else, and that's the tension again, you know, because we want to confess Jesus fully God and fully man. I was going to say, Willem in his book, he criticizes the functional and canonic uh, theory of Christology. Uh, specifically because in their effort to emphasize the humanity, um, they neglect to recognize uh, the cosmological implications of a Jesus who would not carry on his uh, deity duties. For example, he says, what do you make of Hebrews chapter 1 or Colossians chapter 1, where it says that he sustains the universe? Mm -hmm. And so if throughout the incarnation, he somehow had a temporary stop. Mm -hmm. What happened yeah. with that? And so that's, that's something that Willem brings up and says, it, it, right? You know, functional, uh, functional, uh, canonic uh, um, Christology would have an issue responding to that, right? As well as the others, right? Have you talked to a Jehovah Witness about that? <laughs> mm. That's exactly the same point they make for denying Jesus' deity. If Jesus is God, how, what, who was taking care of the universe when he was here? But that's completely ignorance of the Trinitarian doctrine that we hold, you know? And also of the, um, <clears throat> Calvin used to, used to talk about the extra Calvinisticum. Have you, have you heard, have you come in the, you tell me, have you come to the, have you come to that place where I'm pretty sure Wellum has to say something about that or the extra Calvinisticum means that even if God is incarnated in the person of Jesus, there is a mysterious way in which he still is present all over. How that again, how do you explain that? Are you with me with this, guys? This is, this is not a, a finished task. Calcedon didn't, didn't resolve our problems. Yes. Do we have to answer all these questions? Yes, for passing the class. We can throw these questions. You write a book. 
<laughs> right, you need to learn Spanish too. <laughs> okay, class, let's, uh, let's see you next, next class. Yes, God bless you. Jesus and Judaism by E.P. Sanders. And the other is Jean, or however you pronounce it, it's a French guy. I know that you don't like French people, but that's fine. You need to learn to read them too. Jean Gallot is it's a, it's a Jesuit. Who is Christ? A theology of the incarnation. Do you recommend anything from Hans Kahn? Sure, it's good, but after you read these others, because you don't want to be confused with.